the energy that is going on right now is very much, you know, I, I mean, I look at the logo of our, um, of our community that, that Phoenix, and this is a very, this is very much a Phoenix time. Um, we as a nation kind of have a chance to get a little rebirth after um, a period that uh, angered and scared all of us, I think. Uh, I see us, you know, we're, we're really starting to work together to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. And that, that's very hopeful. And it, in some ways, feels like a new start. I mean, I know that many of my um, extremely progressive friends are probably, you know, almost as angry at, um, at the Democrats as, as many of us were with the folks in power before. But um, it, it really feels like we have a chance. And, you know, the, the whole thing with COVID and, and now that, I mean, we have not turned the corner yet in terms of the number of people who are dying and the number of people who are in hospitals quite everywhere. And in some places are, you know, pushing it back up again. But the fact that so many people have either gotten one or both doses of the vaccine really makes me feel like we're, we're turning a corner. So what, what Easter means, I mean, obviously for each of us, it goes back to whatever we grew up thinking Easter meant and what people told us. Um, it, we, we were in, in seminary, we called that people's embedded theology. And, you know, as all of us think about our own um, cultural beliefs, you know, like when, we, when we're examining ourselves in terms of, am I racist? You know, uh, uh, you know, do I really think racist things or, you know, am, am I a sexist or am I, you know, am I leaving anybody behind because of my privilege or simply the way I grew up, which is privilege in a lot of cases, but just the, the, the way our, our, our kind of unhealthy culture has focused itself, right? Well, with Easter, you know, it's an amalgam of, of our uh, religion, culture, family, and just how, how we understood the Christian mythos. So the thing that we have to ask ourselves is, does Easter really mean what I think it means? And, you know, I know for me personally, for a long time, you know, of course, Easter was a day when we got new clothes went to church and got a big basket full of candy, you know, like when I was a kid, but it was also the end of that story of the life of that, that, you know, Mr. Perfect boy, Jesus, that just never, I could never completely swallow it. I just, you know, just never really got it. So <laughs> among the things that, that, you know, I mean, that have, have come up to me in, in pop culture recently is there's this meme out there that basically says that Easter uh, comes from Ishtar. And so just for everybody's fund of general knowledge, no, it does not. All right. Easter and Ishtar have nothing to do with each other and not just these two guys. And some of you may not even know what this is, but there was a really bad movie with Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty called Ishtar. And that's not it either. Okay. So just so we have a common frame of reference, this is the this is kind of the deal that they tried to sell me when I was a kid. Um, that Easter played in completely, you know, it was like it was the the pivot point of Easter. So the more or less official version, official Christian version, you know, as 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 me as a Baptist growing up was given was that Jesus was God's only Son right? Only begotten son. I heard that so many times. It just made me want to throw up. Only begotten son. And he was a blood sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. Except the people that didn't espouse belief in him. And that's a whole different part of the contract. So, and, and another thing that was really kind of difficult to believe, but you had to buy into it, was that even though he, he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Five days later, the crowd is yelling, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas, and they're, they're sending Jesus to be nailed to a cross. 
I, it, you know, why? Because he broke the ATM. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's, um, I don't know. You know, and, and another thing, and this is, this is like getting deeper into it. You know, it's kind of strange that in spite of the fact that back in those days, when the Roman government, and it was only the Roman government that could crucify people, when they crucified somebody, they left them up there to rot as an example. Because that's, that's how you make, that's why you stick them up in the air, right? So people can see them and you leave them there. So they can see what happens to you if you don't uh, kowtow to Rome. So that's that's just a little, you know, another one of those things. It's like, eh. so after a couple of nights in the tomb, somebody and or some people, and it varies depending on which gospel you're reading, they go to the tomb to anoint his body. One thing they did not explain is how is that woman or those women supposed to roll back this ginormous stone that we always see them talking about? Just, just you know, just a little, little curious about that. And in every version, no matter which one it was, Jesus is not there, all right? Now, Jesus is then reported to be seen in other places after his death in the additional ending to Mark and in the rest of the Gospels. And what a lot of people um, don't know is that the original ending of Mark is simply the empty tomb. That, you know, what, what we have that has been traced back to the earliest source was, I think it's Mark, it's the last chapter, verse 9, I think, that it ends. But it, it's, it's very um, evocative. And, you know, the kind of the meaning is left to the listener, it would have been back then, because it was a, it was a, a an oral tradition uh, story, or to the reader once it was written down. But, you know, several decades later, after, you know, Luke and Matthew, and then later, later than that, John were written, they went back and they kind of added a little coda to Mark that said, oh yeah, and he was seen in other places later on, blah, blah, blah. Just, just to kind of make them all uh, say the same thing. And then risen Jesus, quote, you know, in, in quotes, chooses to ascend to heaven. And in, in the case of the Luke-Acts narrative, he does it two times. And it, if you weren't aware, Luke and Acts are believed to have been written by the same author as a single narrative. Uh, and they're simply divided into two, into two separate um, books in the Bible. But uh, it's, it's really one long narrative from the same author. Uh, but Jesus actually ascends twice in that narrative, which is kind of interesting. It's like, hey, guys, I'm, you know, I'm going to go check out, um, you know, maybe look around for an apartment, you know, see what I can, you know, see what I can arrange. I'll be back. You know, and then he comes back for a while, and then he's okay. Now I'm going, and I'm gonna. This is the real time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, and I'm, I'm not coming back this time. So that's that's kind of you know what the uh, the evangelical types expect us to buy into, and you know you, you kind of don't have any choice, right? Because what they're talking about is something that um, we refer to as substitutionary atonement. That idea that it's about a blood sacrifice so that we all get to go to heaven instead of going to hell, right? So, and I, I have, I've pulled a lot of quotes from my favorite book on Easter, which is called The Last Week by uh, Borg and Cross. And, and if you haven't read it already, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you have a problem finding a Jesus in the Bible that you can make sense of, that the Jesus that they will introduce you to from the book of Mark, which was the oldest gospel uh, in the last week of his life, is one that uh, I'm all about that guy. So as they say, without an emphasis on Easter as God's decisive reversal of the authority's verdict on Jesus, the cross is simply pain, agony, and horror. It leads to a horrific theology God's judgment means that we all deserve to suffer like this 
but Jesus died in our place. And that was the theology I grew up with. You are a, a, you are a sinner who deserves to be damned to hell, except that, you know, Jesus died for your sins. Baptists are really heavy on this part as well. Yeah. And like the older I get, the more creeped out it gets me because like, as a kid, I was pretty morbid. So like, it didn't phase me one bit. And I, you know, I didn't even think about it. And like in the past few years, that part of it has specifically um, weighed on me very heavy, heavily. And I can tell that I have like long lasting trauma effects from that. Um, yeah. Just that because when I got, when I got pregnant, especially it became very real for me. Sure. And um, I could not, I could not think of myself for a long time as a good person when I also had had a baby when I wasn't supposed to. And, you know, the harm that that does is substantial, <laughs> so oh, very yeah. substantial. Yeah. Laura, weren't you, it was like the night before you turned eight years old and now you're responsible for your soul. Um, wasn't, wasn't that the, the deal in the Mormon church? Yeah, your, your age of accountability is eight. You're not responsible for your sins until the age of eight. So like as I was seven years old, getting ready to turn eight, I was praying I would die before I turned eight because then I could go to heaven and I wouldn't end up going, you know, to hell for sins I was suddenly responsible for. Yeah. The amount of pressure we put on children is just like that's it's insane yeah it is yeah for for children to be worried about you know maybe i better die before i turn eight years old so i can go to heaven that's that's kind of sick so yeah. th this idea that easter's not about substitutionary atonement you know that easter is a reversal of good friday and that that means God's vindication of Jesus's passion for the kingdom of God, that place that Jesus talked about where, you know, we all take care of each other, where as the minor prophets um, talked about, you know, everybody has their own piece of land and, you know, there's enough for everybody to have a little good stuff like figs and, and grapes on their vines and nobody is afraid that that place of distributive justice, right? that kingdom of God, for God's justice, you know, and God's no to the powers who killed Jesus, powers which, as the authors point out, are still very much active in our world. Easter's about God as, as much as it is about Jesus. It discloses the character of God and means that God's great cleanup of the world has begun, but it will not happen without us. And I love this little, you know, I don't know what you call a motivational poster or meme or whatever it says, but the message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. You know, and I, I think whoever wrote this probably didn't mean it the way I read it, but to me, it's that that world of, of fairness and compassion and distributive justice that Jesus talked about and taught and died for that, that he's inviting us to come into. So this is where it gets really personal. Good Friday and Easter, death and resurrection together are a central image in the New Testament for the path to a transformed self. The path involves dying to an old way of being and being reborn into a new way of being. And, I, and you know, at, hey, Haley can actually see it this week. You know, the image I have here is, is the image of a phoenix. And that really is... It's, a, it's just a huge part of being alive. And the thing that we have to realize, and, and I know that we talked about this a lot when we were doing the um, Finding Yourself in Transition series, you know, where there's, there's going to be an ending and then there's going to be some time in the void, but then there will be a new beginning at some point. And you can't get to a new beginning without the ending and the time in the void. And I think, I mean, 
I can't even, I don't think I can remember. I could, I could even express all the ways I've reinvented myself in my 61 years and I'm not done. You know, I, I know that I'm going to be reinvented again a few more times before I step off of this planet. And I am so delighted that I've had to die the ways that I've had to die, because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be who I am today, where I am with the love of my life. And I think it's, it's helpful to remind ourselves, you know, sometimes as we're going through those, those deaths, you know, we're dying to an old way of being and we can't see what's on the other side yet. Easter allows us to have some faith that, you know, there is something there and it may be even more amazing and magical than we ever thought possible much less what we can imagine in this dark moment right now. I mean, I, personally, I, I, I remember um, the morning, well, it would have been the morning after my um, kid's mother told me I had, I had to leave. Um, you know, I'd gotten drunk one, one time too many, and, and she decided I had to go. And um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't, it was like life ended, you know, I had lost my wife, my kids, my uh, place to live, and my crutch that I'd relied on since I was 14, you know, which was alcohol. And I, I remember sitting with my, my girls around the kitchen table, you know, all three of us crying our eyes out and me apologizing to them and telling them I had to leave. And I mean, that's about as low as, you know, I, I, I've ever felt in my life. It really felt like my life was over with. Um, but without that, that day, I don't have 18 years of sobriety like I do right now. And I, I haven't, you know, learned how to get in there and work on the issues that I've had because I don't have recovery in my life. And man, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful today that I died that day, you know? So you know, Easter talks to us about transformation at at that personal level, as well as talking about, you know, in the big picture, what the kingdom of God is worth. Mark and Dominic say that when only the personal meaning is emphasized, and that's what we were just talking about, we betray the passion for which Jesus was willing to risk his life. And that passion was the kingdom of God. And it led him to Jerusalem as the place of confrontation with the domination system of his time, execution, and vindication. So now, big picture, the political meaning of Good Friday and Easter sees the human problem as injustice and the solution as God's justice. And, you know, I was just talking about this. So really, I mean, okay, so for us today, we need to know that. We need to to take a look at it and say, hey, Jesus was willing to lay down his life for the kingdom of God, for this idea that was so big that it was worth dying for. It was worth not, not just dying for, but it was worth going straight to the center of the enemy camp saying, this is worth your life and then dying for it, right? I like how they say it can be life beyond an ending brought about by injustice and loss and disease and whatever. Easter inspires us to keep going and to keep the faith. And I found this little meme about keeping the faith. It says, keep the faith. The most amazing things in life tend to happen right at the moment you're about to give up hope. In it, in 12 step, I have, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, don't quit before the miracle happens, because we see it. You know, I've, I've seen that miracle in my life, that miracle that, you know, I don't, I don't need to drink today. I don't, you, I don't even think about it. I don't, I really don't want to. For, for a guy like me, that's a miracle. A lot of people don't get there. They, they give up and a lot of them go back out and die. And that's not an exaggeration. So that, that idea that, you know, when it seems really dark, you sometimes you just suck it up and keep going because it's going to get better. Well, that's, that's Easter. That's, that's 